Hi, everyone. Thank you, Daniel, for your introduction. And thank you also to Fran uh, for her help in, or in organizing this event. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here at the Korea Society. Um, and I've come to many events here, so it's nice to be on the other side of the podium this time around. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, my research. And um, time permitting, I'll be reading a couple of excerpts from the book itself. And um, I'll just begin by saying, you know, as Daniel mentioned, I'm a cultural anthropologist. And I did my doctoral research at NYU. Um, and the, the book is really a culmination of my dissertation research, which began in 1999. Um, I should also mention that I myself am not an adoptee. I was um, born in Canada to Korean immigrant parents who then moved to Long Island and raised me there. Um, so I'm a kind of North American, Korean American. Um, but I was drawn to the study of adoption when I was a graduate student at NYU because it really brought together some very interesting intellectual questions for me. Um, at the time, I was really interested in issues of race, subjectivity, nation, and, um, and family or kinship. And also around that time in 1999, anthropologists and other scholars were increasingly uh, starting to investigate the cultural effects of globalization. And what I found among adoptees were their movements, their transnational movements between Korea and their countries of adoption really exemplified some of these globalization processes in important and fascinating ways. So um, what I'll do today is uh, talk about how I got interested in this research project and uh, give a brief overview of the history of Korean adoption and um, go into more detail about the emergence of what is now known as the adult Korean adoptee global network. And also um, talk about the relationship between adoptees and South Korea and the South Korean state. Um, so when I began my research in 1999, there was actually very little uh, existing scholarship on transnational adoption from South Korea. What existed were mostly psychological or social work studies, but not much in the way of social science um, or anthropology. And um, But 1999 was also a year in which Chi adoptions from China were really starting to um, make waves. And there was a lot of coverage in the mass media um, of Chinese adoptions, especially in the, in the New York City area. So that was part of the kind of climate of, um, of social life when I started to do my research. And I, I began to realize that um, even though Chinese adoption seemed very new, that there had existed this um, earlier wave of international adoptees from Asia that um, had not really been given its uh, intellectual or academic due. So um, I'll begin by, by uh, drawing your attention to this photo. And um, some of you in the audience may even recognize it. <laughs> um, this is uh, uh, an image from the 2010 uh, International Korean Adoptee Association gathering. And the gathering has become a kind of uh, frequently held international conference um, since 1999. And um, in this case, it was held in Seoul in August 2010. And the image is from a press conference that was held by the members of the planning committee. So the um, members of the planning committee come from different nations. Um, you can tell by the flags that are uh, on, the t on the podium here. And there's someone from France, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and then uh, three members from the US. And it's interesting because I think you know this is th these conferences have become a way of um, presenting kind of public face for Korean adoption, and the you know the image here you might think that there were delegates from different nations, right? And I I, I think that's an interesting way in which adoptees have become uh, representatives of themselves of what one adoptee calls adoptee nation, and that's actually the title of a documentary being produced by a Danish um, adoptee artist. 
Um, so this is one of the adopted, adopted territories that I talk about in my book. And so I'm really, I became interested in how adult adoptees were starting to territorialize global space and to create these um, uh, forums in which they could explore their collective identities as Korean adoptees and not only explore it, but create it. Um, so in the process of meeting each other, they were actually producing a collective Korean adoptee identity. Um, so I'm going to step back a little bit and, you know, as an anthropologist, you know, uh, we're, mo most ethnographies that anthropologists write begin with an entry narrative. So in the days of yore, it was arriving on an island or at the entry to a village and kind of talking about um, what, uh, you know, sort of setting the scene for the um, subsequent study of the, um, of the social life of a given community. But in my case, my entry narrative actually begins with a website. Um, I stumbled upon the website for the Korean American Adoptive Family uh, and Adoptee Network, or CON, as it's known. And this was in 1999. And the, the information on the website stated that there were 160,000 uh, adoptees, I'm sorry, it said 140,000, but it's actually closer to 160 or um, 200,000 adoptees worldwide. And, um, you know, when I read that information, I just couldn't believe it. I was completely flabbergasted. And I thought, how is it possible that as a Korean American graduate student, I don't know about this? And so that was really the moment in, in which I became really curious. Well, what does it mean that so many Korean children were adopted into white homes? across the US and Western Europe. And as I started to meet more adoptees, I realized that that sense of isolation or that sense of being a singular person, a singular um, entity, or what some adoptees call being an alien, um, was actually quite common for adoptees, especially those who were raised in the 1970s or earlier. So um, you know, the fact that even in my own experience, I was unable to connect um, someone I actually knew as an adoptee to these broader historical and social contexts was quite telling. Um, and the, the other thing I'll say just to, as a way of a preface is that um, as an anthropologist, um, I was, I, I'm really focused on the collective articulations of adoptees, and I'm less interested in defining adoptees as a group or as a type. Um, and, you know, when I've presented about my research in other contexts, people are often wanting to know, to uh, have an answer to that question, well, who are adoptees? Um, but what I found is that, you know, first of all, adoptees as a um, population are, you know, are, um, it's an incredibly diverse population in terms of, uh, you know, location, in terms of um, geographical location, in terms of class, in terms of religion. Um, and, you know, all the other vectors of difference that we can imagine. So it's very difficult, I think, to come up with a uh, typical Korean adoptee. Um, of course, everyone tries to do this. Adoptees themselves try to come up with ways in which they're similar and in ways in which they're different. And that's what I was interested in. What are adoptees saying about themselves? What are they, uh, what are they doing and what are they creating in the process of meeting each other and trying to define themselves as a collective uh, group. So I really focused on the, um, what I found to be these new cultural expressions or new social formations uh, that adoptees were participating in. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, when I started to uh, become aware of Korean adoption in 1999, suddenly I was seeing Korean adoption everywhere. And these are some images from books that appeared in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, uh, there are a few anthologies uh, of creative writing by adoptees. These are all Korean adoptees, a uh, couple of memoirs, and um, a more academic collection. And these are all um, forms of expressive culture that adoptees were have been engaging in uh, since the late 1990s. And it's really the, the those kinds of um, cultural productions that I think can tell us a lot about what the experiences have been for adoptees. And moreover, as these texts and other cultural forms have circulated, they've helped adoptees to also imagine themselves as part of a larger community.
So um, here also are some documentary films that appeared in the late 1990s. Uh, searching for Goyang, Passing Through, First Person Plural. And these um, were also important uh, cultural texts that helped to publicize adult Korean adoptee experience, not only among adoptees, but among the general public. Um, all of these appeared on PBS uh, channels and were broadcast um, nationwide, and they also appeared in film festivals. Um, so even though a big part of my research looks at how the internet was a significant technology that helped to bring adoptees together, these kinds of uh, media texts also were really important. And what we've had more recently are these other documentaries and fiction films that have been produced by Korean adoptees that um, kind of take the stories of adoptees to another level. Uh, what you had in the in the earlier wave were mostly stories about returning to Korea and finding birth family and sort of exploring the issues that are related to um, identity and family. And in these other uh, films, the, um, the sort of what's become a kind of typical narrative of search for birth family reunion has um, expanded to consider broader questions about what it means to be part of a transnational family or putting the experience of Korean adoption into a broader context. Um, and, you know, for that reason, it's actually been quite interesting and important to me to be able to look at these sorts of texts and learn from them, because much of what I've been trying to do as well has been to put the individual and collective experiences of adoptees into these broader contexts. Um, and, uh, w you know, much of what my book looks at is precisely those kinds of questions. How can we understand the history of Korean adoption um, in relationship to U.S., South Korea, political economic relationships, in relationship to broader histories of immigration from South Korea to the West, um, and also in relationship to the rise of multiculturalism and globalization? Okay, so I, I have prepared some slides of um, statistics that can address um, some of the broader um, uh, demographic and um, historical roots of adoption, but I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because I don't want it to take up too much time. But certainly you're, you should feel free to ask me questions about this during the Q&A. Um, but briefly, oops. Okay, briefly, um, these are statistics from the South Korean Ministry of Health and Welfare, and it shows over 165,000 adoptees from South Korea to other countries since 1953. And I just want to draw your attention to the fact that the largest numbers of adoptees were sent during the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, by the late 1990s, the numbers started to um, become more restricted. And um, today there are about 1,000, 900 to 1,000 adoptees who leave South Korea every year for Western countries. Uh, this is a chart that shows where Korean children were sent. The vast majority were sent to the US, over 70%. Uh, the next largest receiving nation was France. And Scandinavian countries have also received the largest per capita Korean children of all nations. Uh, this is a chart that shows the reasons for um, relinquishment of Korean children for overseas adoption. And um, I'll just note that the main reason for adoption in the 50s and 60s was abandonment or a broken home. But those uh, circumstances shifted dramatically by the 70s and 80s where uh, uh, the it was actually single women or unwed mothers who were slowly became the um, main uh, reason for sending children overseas for adoption. And that is certainly the case today where well over 90% of children sent for adoption overseas are born to single women. And this last chart just shows the gender ratios of children and also um, how many were, cons were categorized as disabled. Um, so the gender ratios have also shifted dramatically in large part because it is single women who are abandoning children um, and their gender, the, gen the sex ratios for women who 
um, have children out of wedlock are roughly 50-50. But um, the preference of Korean adopters in South Korea are for girl children now. So the vast majority of children sent overseas are now boys. Um, the uh, ratio of healthy to disabled children has also sh uh, shifted in an interesting pattern because in the 1950s and 60s, it's the healthy disabled is a kind of um, loose translation. It's really normal or abnormal in Korean. So the normal would, would have been considered in the 50s and 60s a full Korean child versus a mixed race. And today it means a child that may not be perfect who is then categorized as uh, disabled or, or not normal. OK, so um, like I said before, if you have any questions about these statistics, I'm happy to go over them uh, later on. And um, this last, uh, these last set of images are, um, if they'll come up. OK, there we go. Uh, just show some of the reproductive trends in South Korea since the early 2000s. South Korea currently has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. It has, um, it's considered one of the lowest low fertility nations, which means that uh, South Koreans are not uh, reproducing fast enough to uh, maintain their population. So this is a huge demographic crisis and an economic, uh, an impending economic crisis for South Korea. So this is one of the ironies and contradictions of South Korean modernity, where you have a, a nation which is considered to be an advanced nation by many um, observers, and yet it continues to send children for adoption. So transnational adoption is typically associated with developing nations, and yet uh, you have South Korea with um, a below replacement level fertility rate still sending roughly 1,000 children overseas for adoption. And on the left, there's a chart that shows the numbers of uh, children born out of wedlock. And globally speaking, South Korea's um, rate of unwed motherhood is actually quite low. Um, but because of social and, and cultural stigmas against unwed motherhood, there's, um, that's usually the reason cited for uh, the continuing um, dependence on international adoption to solve those, those problems. OK. Um, the next set of slides I've prepared uh, look at the origins of Korean adoption. And um, I'm actually really fascinated by um, the early history of adoption. You know, how is it that South Korea became the largest sending nation in the world of children to um, countries overseas? And it all uh, stems from the Korean War and the Cold War. So during the uh, Korean War, as many of you may know, um, children were born to Korean women and fathered by American or UN soldiers. And the, cri the so-called crisis in mixed race children led to the solution of international adoption. So the idea was to uh, send the children to their fatherlands. Uh, typically, that meant the U.S. And it, you know, this was a this was framed as a largely humanitarian um, project, um, but it was also linked directly to questions of uh, national security and um, and uh, uh, diplomatic relations. So this is a quote from Ebony Magazine, which appeared in September 1955, and it featured mixed race African American. Korean children. And the uh, article's title is How to Adopt Korean Babies. Um, and the quote that I've pulled here says, for both political and humanitarian reasons, officials in the US State Department hope that these children will find homes in America. Their adoption would, quote, effectively counteract any drop in America's prestige in that part of the world. And this is really has to do with the fact that um, at the time, North Korea was using the appearance of mixed race children as a kind of uh, Cold War um, uh, campaign to um, vilify South Korea and the US and to uh, suggest that South Korea was actually being colonized by the US and that these children were a visible manifestation of that um, relationship. 
Syngman Rhee, the first president of South Korea, also considered them to be a major PR liability in, in his Cold War campaign. And so he was very invested in removing these children as quickly as possible. Moreover, in the US, um, American missionaries and other humanitarian groups were fixated on this idea of the Korean War orphan. And this is an ad from World Vision uh, in the Los Angeles Times from 1956. And it's, it says, a Korean orphan for you. Many inquire, how can I help Korean orphans? Although few can bring them to this country, you can be a mother or daddy to your own child in a Christian orphanage in Korea. So these kinds of ideas were quite prevalent in the 1950s, the idea of saving Korean children. This, this was really an advertisement for sponsoring a child. Um, but many of these kinds of campaigns led to the desire among many Americans to actually adopt Korean children into their home. Um, and this last image is a picture from the Jeju Island Orphanage in, from 1955. And these are children who were evacuated to Jeju Island from Seoul. Um, and um, I use it just as a kind of um, uh, indication of how orphanages in South Korea during the post-war period um, really expanded exponentially from the 1950s through the 1960s. And much of this um, was due to the war and to the massive social dislocation connected to um, South Korea's rapid modernization. So many of the children who were housed in these orphanages, orphanages were not actually orphaned. Um, they were left there as a form of daycare by their parents who were either too poor to feed them or educate them or who um, had no other form of uh, child care. So um, the, but yet the image of the Korean orphan that appeared in the U.S. media oftentimes assumed that these children were, orphanage, were orphans. And in fact, I found an article from a Christian American magazine from the 1950s that the title of which was Korea, the land of orphans. And that's really was a very dominant image of Korea at the time. And also, um, therefore, it was very common for Americans, especially Christian Americans, to believe that it was their duty, it was their moral obligation to adopt uh, from Korea to save children. And um, this is a fun image of um, the uh, World Vision Korean Orphan Choir from the 1960s. And some of you may be familiar with this um, phenomenon. So these children were, uh, you know, they, they traveled all over the world. They were actually quite famous. Um, they traveled well into the 1980s. And they also helped to contribute to this idea that Korea was the land of orphans. Um, and World Vision used them as a major fundraising uh, mechanism. Um, the irony is that, and I haven't quite um, verified this, but from what I've heard, uh, the children who were in this orphan choir may have started off as orphans, but later on they became so famous and so well regarded that Korean parents desperately wanted their children to be um, to be singers in the choir. So um, by you know by the uh, uh, by the end they were no longer even orphans. They were you know children from middle class families who were very ambitious. Um, okay, and to um, get to my book. So, but what, the reason that I, that I spent some time talking about uh, the image of the Korean orphan is because one of the things that I really try to explore in my book is what is the impact of that kind of image or that idea uh, or that association of Korea with war orphans and orphans in general. And what I found among adoptees is that um, orphan, what I call the orphan myth, um, is actually quite prevalent and quite pernicious. And it has um, followed adult adoptees throughout their lives. So for a lot of them, trying to shed that association with being an orphan um, was really important, especially in terms of creating this kind of collective ident identification, um, especially because many of the children who were adopted, especially between the 1950s and the 1970s, really believed that they were orphans, meaning both of their biological parents were dead. So um, it really wasn't until adoptees reached a critical mass 
and had started to return to Korea and to find their Korean families, that they realized, oh, actually, I'm not an orphan. And why is it that um, uh, for so much of my life, I've been identified as an orphan and have actually believed that I was an orphan? So really kind of demystifying um, that orphan myth is um, one of the themes in my book and I argue is uh, part of the cultural work that adoptees have tried to do in their adoptive, adoptive countries as well as in South Korea. Um, and this image is, these images are also from the uh, international gatherings that took place in Seoul in 2007. They've taken place from 1999 in different parts of the world, but since 2004 they've been held in Seoul. Um, and what I, um, emphasize here is how these kinds of collective gatherings, and I think it's important that they're face to face. These are moments in which adoptees may have connected online, they may have met each other through regional associations, but going to these kinds of conferences where anywhere from 400 to 800 adoptees gather in one place for, you know, four to five days has, can be really life transforming for some adoptees just to see the scale and scope of their community. And the fact that these take place in Korea is also very significant because it's, um, for many of them, a symbolic homecoming. It's a moment for them to uh, return to their country of birth, but within the community structure and within a context where they can um, uh, feel as if they're identifying as a particular kind of Korean. They're not trying to fit into a sort of essentialized notion of what a Korean person should be, but returning as a Korean adoptee. Um, another aspect of uh, Korean adoptee experience that I explore in my book is their relationship to South Korea and the South Korean state. And uh, one of the things that the South Korean government um, was in a way uh, um, compelled to do in the late 1990s was to recognize adoptees, overseas adoptees, as Koreans in some way. So um, by 1998, adult Korean adoptees ha who are living in Korea petitioned the South Korean state to recognize them as overseas Koreans, or Jewe Dongpo. So that meant that they would be um, eligible for a special visa status that would allow them to return to South Korea for extended periods of time. And in line with this, this is an image from the overseas Korean Foundation uh, Summer Cultural Program for Overseas Adoptees. And so they developed these programs to help adult adoptees return to Korea and learn something about what it means to be Korean. So these programs are typically focused on traditional Korean culture, um, you know, adoptees dressing up in hanbok and learning how to make kimchi, um, such as these images here. Um, and, but, it, but what's also important to recognize is the broader context of globalization in South Korea, where the proactive globalization policy of the South Korean state really invested in this idea that overseas Koreans need to feel a kind of sentimental connection to the motherland. And so adoptees were included as these kinds of um, ethnic Koreans who could help benefit South Korea, especially in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Um, okay, so I think what I'll do now is just read a couple of excerpts uh, from the book. And um, the one I'll start with is from a section called uh, Contingent Essentialisms. And the um, uh, you know, this, one, of the, one of the things that I try to do in the book is to understand in what ways adoptees understand themselves to be connected to each other. And so many times I would talk to adoptees and they would describe these sort of instant bonds that they felt upon meeting each other. And much of that is conditioned by the fact that so many of them felt extremely isolated when they were growing up. And so as adults, to meet each other for the first time could be incredibly... Uh, life transforming. So I'll just read a few pages from this section. 
Uh, in this chapter, I unpack the profound sense of shared personhood and self-sameness that is frequently articulated in adoptee discourses. A particularly suggestive comment was made by the president of the Swedish Adopted Korean Organization, uh, AKF. Daniel Kim, who's the president, when in a speech addressed to an audience of adoptees at AKF's 10th anniversary celebration remarked, I have a family in Sweden and a family in Korea. You are my third family. It's important to take care of each other because we are a family and I could be you, you could be him, he could be her. As a, someone who has reunited with his Korean parents, Daniel offers a model of kinship that is not exclusive but additive, transnational and expansive. In addition, his message highlights a central point of this chapter, namely that adoptee kinship or relationships of intimacy and identification actualized through and necessitating continued practices of care and reciprocity is founded on the arbitrariness and contingency of adoption histories and the fact that, quote, I could be you, you could be him, he could be her. Hence, adoptee family is based on a peculiar mix of inalienability and substitutability that recalls the ambivalent origins of adoptees who may be viewed either as precious gifts or as exchangeable commodities. Other adoptees employ different metaphors and models for describing the often instantaneous effective ties among adoptees. Susan Zuncum Cox described the peculiar bond that adoptees share as being akin to that of other groups of people who have uncommon life experiences. Um, she said, quote, it is beyond words, but I would imagine it's similar to other people who have other, any other common profound experience. If you are a cancer survivor, if you are a POW, Obviously, these are very extreme and bad examples, but it's that the experience is so unique that it's hard to explain to someone else who hasn't had it. Even if it's someone who has a very negative view of their adoption experience, or someone who has a very positive view of their adoption experience, the key is being with others who are, you know, just like me. I mean, those are the words that you just hear over and over. Those are the words that are the natural expression that people have about it. And I think perhaps people think that we just sit around and talk about it all the time, when in fact that is the magic. You don't have to discuss it at all. It's just deeply and profoundly understood without words." Un end quote. Thus, adoptees do not share one singular and momentous historical event from which they draw their collective memory. Instead, their adoption narratives often describe a co common experiences of profound isolation, liminality, and survival. As the journalist Mark Hagland adopted as an infant with his twin in 1961 to a German-Norwegian Lutheran family uh, in Wisconsin told me, growing up in Milwaukee, it felt like I was a Martian who landed in a spaceship. And then I discovered that there were other Martians and they were having Martian conventions. So it's very intense and powerful because none of us had a peer group and we didn't identify as Korean Americans or usually even as Asian Americans. And yet we were discriminated against and singled out and identified usually in a negative light. So for us now, it's amazing. It's like a club that you can only join by the circumstances of your birth and your life because you have been born in Korea and adopted either to the US or another country outside Korea. And it's pretty amazing, you know. Thomas Park Clement articulated his sense of group membership in this way. First of all, to be a member, you are a member whether you want to or not. If you're a Korean adoptee, then you're enlisted. Whether you're connected through the net or through friends, you're still a member because you have the credentials, the life experience, you share the same ghosts. Kim Park Nelson, then a board member of AK Connection, an adoptee group in Minnesota, responded to my question about the negotiation of differences among adoptees by saying, quote, there's no difference in my mind that trumps the adoptee identity. Obviously not everyone has had the same experience, but everyone has had the same experience of being born in Korea and through whatever process this happens to you, you end up here. That is a common experience and I think that that will continue to be a common experience no matter how culturally sensitive your parents are <clears throat> or how multicultural our society becomes. It will always be part of it. Um, adop adoption credentials confer membership. Cox gives it a mystical, naturalized, and romantic framing, whereas Hagelin sees it as an exclusive club. Park Nelson characterizes it as being grounded in a primary experience, and Clement as an inescapable haunting. These diverse articulations suggest that the fact of adoption, irrespective of particular experiences, constitutes a shared substance, which in turn invites comparisons to inalienable ties of relatedness, often attributed to kinship, as reckoned through blood and biogenetics. <clears throat> 
These potent statements about the shared belonging of adoptees were reinforced by accounts of non-adoptee Korean Americans I've met in adoptee social spaces. These individuals have expressed surprise or displeasure at being made to feel, quote, as if they don't belong. This is what one Korean American friend told me after she accompanied, accompanied me to an adoptee event in Seoul. It is precisely this inversion of normative signification, wherein the marked term is no longer the adoptee, but rather the non-adoptee, that constitutes adoptee kinship based on contingent essentialism. Contingent essentialism is distinct from the biologism or genetic essentialism that characterizes much of the public discourse about adoptees and their real, quote unquote, real origins, identities, or families. The often powerful bonds of relatedness that adoptees claim to share are not based on a common desire for pure origins or as presumptions of genetic essentialism would suggest, but rather on a shared acknowledgement of the instability and uncertainty of origins and the involuntary forfeiture of historical and cultural connections, whether one thinks of oneself as an alien, a foundling, an orphan, or a kidnapped child. OK, I think I'll end there. So thank you very much. anyone has questions, if you could just stand up at the mic, um, and she'll be happy to answer. I am Homer Williams, uh, and I'm a member of the Korea Society. Uh, uh, you raised some, uh, well, so it's a very fraught area, but uh, do you deal with how uh, American attitudes toward adoption in general uh, how, how the changes in those attitudes uh, affect, uh, affected the uh, relationship uh, of the adoptee to, the, to their adopted parents. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, whether you look for birth parents or not, which was uh, actually uh, discouraged or prohibited in the United States until quite recently, and which carried over into international adoption. I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, certainly the attitudes, the sort of prevalent or dominant um, ideologies or uh, accepted practices of adoption have shifted over time. Um, and. Um, Certainly, there have been adoptees whose uh, parents were very open to exploring Korea, to um, uh, exploring the possibility of finding birth parents, et cetera. But you're absolutely right that uh, certainly when Korean adoptions started in the 50s, the prevalent uh, practices in America at the time were you, among domestic adoptees, where you pretended as if you were not adopted. Oftentimes, the child didn't know that he or she was adopted. And there was no looking back. Um, so those kinds of attitudes certainly were translated into Korean adoptions among mi the first mixed race children and also among the Korean adoptees. Obviously, I mean the full Korean adoptees, the, you know, obviously they, the child could figure out that they were not biolog biologically connected to their parents, but nevertheless the social work institutions at the time really emphasized um, an assimilation paradigm. and. Um, <laughs> Uh, to the point that, um, you know, they really uh, encouraged the South Korean government to implement certain legal technologies to ensure that adoptive parents' names would not appear in uh, adoption records in South Korea, because they really wanted no connection to exist, no possibility of those connections to be made. Um, and, you know, the, the reigning assumption was this would protect um, all members of the adoption triad, the children, the birth parents, and the adoptive parents. Um, those attitudes have changed dramatically, right? Now there's a lot of encouragement for openness on all levels, that knowledge, is, knowledge of one's origins is important, that making these kinds of connections can be really vital to the psychological health of adoptees and even of their parents. Um, but individually speaking, I mean, you know, attitudes vary widely. So, um, you know, there's, there's often a narrative that adult adoptees uh, tell 
adult adoptees who were um, adopted between the 50s and the 70s, where um, you know their their own adoptive parents, particularly their mothers, felt very threatened with the idea of them returning to Korea and searching for um, their uh, birth parents. And much of this, I think, is predicated on the ideology that one child should just have one set of parents, and that if there's more than one set of parents, there'll be a, a kind of dueling allegiance. Um, and so, um, you know, I think, as I said before, you know, these attitudes are kind of in flux. Um, and what's encouraged at the level of social workers and policy um, doesn't necessarily mean that everyone subscribes to them equally. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly the tensions between adoptees and adoptive parents exist frequently. I hope that answers your question. Hi, my name is Mark Stempi, a member of Korea Society. Uh, I, I would like you to uh, expand a little bit on this question because that was also one of my questions, but my angle would be more cultural, how the Korean culture uh, influence such attitudes. I've read some books about Koreas, and in one of them, um, there were there was a description of mm, e e Korean mothers as late as the eighties, even faking pregnancies in order to hide the adoption process. So that would be my first question. That I have a second one a little later. Um, yeah, Korean cultural attitudes towards adoption. You're asking about. Yes. Um, Yes, so uh, that's true. <laughs> that, that um, well, I mean, to to and, and then when the shift happened, if you can, because you you mentioned that there is a shift now. So oh, in a, in the U.S. You mean or no in Korea? In there Korea, is a shift. Okay, you so well, I mean, historically speaking, we many of us may know, uh, you know, adoption in Korean societies usually occurred within the patriarchal line. And so if there was the need for a child, especially a male heir, that um, the, um, a son would be adopted within the patrilineal family. So an uncle would adopt his brother's son. Um, but you know, aside from that, there were all sorts of other informal arrangements that would look like adoption as we know it today, especially in the West. Um, but what's happened since the, I would say, the 60s, and 70s is that um, there's been a real reluctance to adopt um, outside of the family line and um, in an open way. So there's, um, you know, despite, you know, international adoption has always been a very sensitive political issue in South Korea. And so since the 1990s, there's been a real push to increase the numbers of domestic adoptions among South Koreans and to lower the number of international adoptions. What they found, though, is that, you know, all these programs that try to encourage South Koreans to adopt, you know, through tax breaks, you know, uh, medical uh, benefits, housing subsidies, they don't work because Korean adopters don't want anyone to know mm. that they're adopting. So, um, so those cultural attitudes certainly are very strong today. At the same time, what you have are, and it tends to be mostly uh, Christians in South Korea who have a more open attitude towards adoption, um, and meaning that they're, um, they don't feel as much obligation to hide the fact that their child has been adopted. And one of the organizations that was actually founded by a Korean American adoptee is a Christian organization that tries to encourage Koreans and Korean Americans to adopt Korean children. Um, openly, meaning the child knows and the community and the family knows. Um, but those are still quite rare. Uh, another problem that you have related to this is that Koreans who adopt, um, uh, it's been said, I, don't, I, I myself haven't done the research, but it's been said, often have very high standards for what the child um, should uh, the, uh, one might say the quality of the child. So there, there are um, a lot of failed adoptions in which children are re-relinquished by adoptive parents. Um, and the, ch oh, the chart that I showed of uh, normal and dis quote unquote disabled children um, shows something like 20% of children adopted overseas are categorized as not normal or disabled. But 
that category is very loose. I mean, it could be a mole, you know, it could, or it could be a congenital heart condition. I mean, it really varies very widely, in part because uh, the standards among Korean adopters is very high for the perfect child. So um, I don't want to paint too grim a picture because I think things are changing in South Korea. Um, and as anyone who follows South Korea at all knows, things change very rapidly. But certainly attitudes about family are, you know, um, sort of slower <laughs> to change. At the same time, it's important to remember that because the birth rate is so low in South Korea, there are actually very few children who are available to be adopted. Mm -hmm. um, and moreover, we don't really have good statistics for domestic adoptions in Korea because many of them are secret. They're not done through agencies. So no one really knows um, how many children are adopted domestically because it happens in the hospital, happens between doctors, or within, you know, between families in a very private way. So um, those are some of the but challenges. Where, where the secrecy, where is the source of that? Um, uh, Again, it's, it's you know, secrecy. it's it's um, it's connected to cultural stigma. Mm. You know, the idea that um, uh, inviting um, a stranger mm. into the family could be risky. So the the family ties culturally are very strong in Korea. And a lot of it is uh, connected to ideas about blood, mm -hmm. to genealogy yes. and mm -hmm. genetics. This mm -hmm. idea that you know there might be some um, unknown aspect to the child that is genetically or genealogically inherited um, that could be a risk. And the second question I'd have um, is how many of the Korean ad adoptees uh, feel, feel, do feel or don't feel the need to explore their roots? And the reason I ask the question is because I personally know a Korean adoptee who, ha who has no desire whatsoever to know anything about Korea. And it's kind of a little strange for me because I am fascinated uh, with Korea. So that's my second yeah. question. Yeah, that's, that's also a, a frequently um, asked question because, um, uh, yeah, certainly not everyone wants to uh, excavate their past. Um, but, um, you know, some adoptees who confront, uh, you know, and, and it happens within families, and this is interesting too, you know, like one sibling, like they'll both be adopted, one sibling goes back to Korea all the time or lives there, you know, has a strong connection, and the other sibling has no interest whatsoever, right, has just completely become very localized. Um, and I don't think there's any way to really predict uh, why that is or how that happens. Uh, like I said before, because of the wide diversity of No, I mean, because the other thing is, is that attitudes towards Korea shift so drastically over time, you know, like an adoptee today could be like, I have no interest whatsoever. And then tomorrow, suddenly be completely driven to go back. And, you know, sometimes it's triggered by certain life events. Adoptees might get sick, have a child, you know, their adoptive parents might be ill or might be, might have passed away. You know, certain things might happen that suddenly lead them to wonder about their origins or the past. But um, yeah, it's very, that's a tough question. Yeah, totally unpredictable. Um, thank you, hello. Um, uh, I was interested in this conference because uh, myself, I'm in a relationship in which uh, we are thinking about adopting. And my partner is um, um, Asian. Uh, woman and since we were so interested about it um, we would start searching and one of the things that um, it makes me a little bit of uncomfortable uh, about adopting a, a Chinese or maybe a Korean child is uh, the crisis that they have in their identity and also uh, I saw a lot of YouTube videos um, about uh, there's an association of biological parents in, in Korea. Uh, they are looking for their children. And basically, they were, uh, there were a lot of single mothers in the association. And they were crying in the video, saying that they didn't have help, that they took their children, uh, that it was against their will, and that perhaps their children will never know that they were looking for them. 
And something like that happened also recently in Haiti. Um, so I'm, I'm very concerned about, you know, it would be like taking somebody's life and oh, not only the child, but the biological parents. And something like that happened in China recently too. Uh, there was a, a scandal about also uh, adoption uh, of a lot of children that were taken uh, by, uh, for, from their parents. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have, I mean, this conference is about also uh, the politics of belonging. So do you talk about that in your book about the, the, the point of view of the adopters and the point of view of the, and the, the biological parents, the consequence, the, the crisis of identity, because most of them are adopt, adopted by uh, another race. So they have an ident identity uh, problem. Uh, they grew up, be be sorry. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a personal thing for me to um, believing that they don't belong. So can you speak about that? Uh, sure, you. yeah, that's, you covered a lot of uh, ground um, and very sensitive issues, but, um, and uh, I'll, I'll try my best to address uh, some of them, but, um, yeah, the issue, um, the issue of transnational adoption is very fraught. Um, and when you add transracial adoption on top of that, it becomes a real um, bundle of um, challenges. So um, one of the things that's happened in the last few years are the um, investigative reports of these scandals that you've mentioned, uh, where so-called orphans, usually from developing nations, are suddenly discovered to not have been orphans at all, but taken under coercion from their original parents. Um, and, you know, one could argue that the roots of that problem was in Korea, too, that, you know, those children were not all orphans and that there were other circumstances, uh, particularly economic ones, that contributed to their um, vulnerability and their eventual adoptions. So um, I think now one of the challenges among anyone involved with adoption is to figure out, well, what, what is truly in the best interests of children, right? The most staunch adoption advocates would say, a poor child in a developing nation, parents or not, will do better in America, right? In a middle-class family, right? That can provide them education, you know, a healthy environment to grow up in, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what you see happening even in instances such as Haiti, where children who are already removed from the country and from their families and adopted into American middle class homes um, aren't returned, right? Because of that idea that it's mu they're, they're just better off, you know, and if once they've already adjusted to life in their families here, it seems like too much of a disruption to send them back. So, um, but those are very, very fraught questions, and I, you know, I can't even pretend to answer them here, certainly. It, it just requires a lot of discussion and, I think, ethical soul-searching, you know, because people have very different attitudes and opinions about this. Um, as far as identity crisis, um, you know, what's happened recently, and this goes back to the initial question about um, changing attitudes, among adoptive parents, you know, not only has the shift been from away from secrecy to openness in the US, but also away from this idea of assimilation to an idea of multiculturalism and really exposing the child to their, uh, to the heritage of their, um, of their birth country. Um, but, you know, one critique that's emerged among adoptees in particular is, well, it's all fine and good to expose us to Korean culture, but Who's going to help us deal with the fact that we're min ethnic minorities in a white majority culture? How can we um, 
equip ourselves to survive. And in the US, as many of you probably know, in the 1970s, the National Association of Black Social Workers came up with a very strong statement against transracial adoption in the early 1970s, precisely because of this. They said, white parents do not have the skills to protect their children from black children from a racist society. And these adoptions are actually not in their best interests. So that was precisely at the moment that adoptions from Korea skyrocketed because people no longer felt they had the moral right to adopt transracially in the US. And it seemed as if Asian children were a better solution, that they would assimilate better, that there was a kind of, there was maybe less discrimination against um, Asians in this country. And we all know that it may be different, but it's not, you know, um, it's not as if it doesn't exist. So, um, so those kinds of issues um, are, are um, still very prevalent. You know, how can adoptive parents um, educate themselves, not just about kimchi and hanbok, right? Which is easy, right? I mean, now there's so many of Korean restaurants in New York, it's like every other block, right? Um, so, um, but what about teaching them how to exist in a multiracial world as a person of color? And um, so those two things, the transracial part and the econo political economic uh, question of where are these children coming from, why were they, why did they become vulnerable in the first place and um, released for adoption? And then the question of race and adjustment, um, you know, those are really, you know, both very complex. And so when you put them together, I think it, you know, um, it requires a lot of, um, a lot of conversation and thinking through. So um, the issue with uh, birth mothers in Korea is there is a movement of uh, birth mothers um, in South Korea who are deciding to keep their children. I'm sorry, there's a movement of birth mothers who are coming out as birth mothers who have sent children abroad. And then there's a movement of unwed mothers who are deciding to keep their children who are actually very actively saying, everyone was telling me to give up this child for adoption. Everywhere I went, there are all these homes for unwed mothers. You, you know, and for you know, single women who are maybe um, uh, don't have good relations with their uh, Korean with their with their parents because they're pregnant. Um, where else can they turn to? So they go to these homes for unwed mothers, and these homes, the vast majority of them, push for international adoption or domestic adoption. So um, the women who have come out to um, resist that are quite courageous. And not only are they doing it um, in order to keep their children, but they're doing it to help publicize the need for a changing attitude towards single motherhood in Korea. And um, so I think as that grows, I think it will become much more complex for thinking about, well, you know, at what are, what are the ethical grounds for international adoption, especially from South Korea? You know, how can we justify that when, um, you know, it may be possible for women to keep their children and raise them as single parents? Um, and uh, for so long, you know, once single motherhood became the primary reason for adoption from South Korea since the late 70s and early 80s, for so long the attitude was, well, Korea is so Confucian, right? Korea is so conservative. These, these attitudes will never go away. It was this idea that it would always be like that. And even in the early 2000s when I was in South Korea, I was saying to Koreans, I was like, well, what if Korean women who are not married kept their children, right? That, that could be a way to um, help these cultural attitudes change. And Koreans at the time were like, no way, that will never happen. Korea's way is totally not ready for that. And, you know, a few years later, suddenly this movement of unwed mothers has gained some traction. So, you know, things do change. And I think that a lot of the strong advocates for um, either ending adoption or restricting international adoption would say, why not spend the money that Twenty or thirty thousand dollars that are spent for a child to be adopted to the U.S. Why not put that money towards helping a woman keep her child? Right? How? How? You know? 
Unfortunately, in South Korea, twenty or thirty thousand dollars won't go that far. But in other developing nations, certainly it would go very far. Um, and the more we hear stories of unethical or um, even illegal adoptions, it you know I think it requires us to really think through these dynamics much more carefully. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for your comments. I have to be honest; this is the first time I've ever attended an event or even tried to look into the idea of being a Korean adoptee. And um, and I was one of those adoptees who never really thought about it. So I just kind of lived my life and whatever happens, happens. And I love my parents and my family. But then when I had my first two children who are very young right now, um, it was the first time in my life for some reason I started thinking about what it's like to be the biological mother of, of children. And um, I actually thought about possibly going back to Korea to visit, because I haven't been back there. I don't speak the language. And I'm a little intimidated to go back not speaking the language. And so I was wondering if you had in your book any studies on um, how often, how high the success rate is. If you did go back, did the adoptees typically find their mothers? Or was it, because part of me thinks it's probably impossible at this point. It's been so long ago that I was adopted. And then my second question related to this is, um, when I was younger, I didn't know too many Korean people, but when I met one woman, she chastised me quite a while for not going back to Korea. And she said that Koreans are the chosen people. Have you heard that phrase? Or Because <laughs> if you grew up in New York, if you know, if you have a lot of jo Jewish friends, the Jewish are the chosen people. So I was like, who's the chosen people? So those are my two questions. Oh, I'll deal with the second one first, I think. <laughs> so Joseon is the name of ancient Korea. Oh. So, um, <laughs> there you <go. laughs> so like North Korea call, uh, you know, themselves Joseon, okay. um, and uh, you know other other ethnic Koreans are known as Joseon people. So yeah, in in American um, pronunciation, be chosen. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't know if you knew the success rates of Matt going back. Yeah, to that's very hard to say. What I what I can say is that uh, I don't know when you were adopted, but the among adoptees who were um, adopted from the '80s till now, the records are much better than I was 70s. earlier. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, in the '70s, I think it's kind of um, pretty uneven, and also depends on your agency. And yeah. though the agent, the Korean agencies now have, I think, I want to say, become a little bit more open. But uh, for a long time, there's a lot of tension between adoptees searching and adoption agencies and the social workers who felt an obligation to either protect the identity of birth parents mm -hmm. or even protect the reputation of the agencies. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there exist um, many programs and uh, support groups and NGOs in South Korea to help adoptees with birth family search. Um, and I can, I'm happy to talk to you more about it later. Um, and uh, so the success rates are really hard to say. But typically what happens is adoptees will go to the agency for to look at their records. And if that doesn't really go anywhere, then they might um, solicit help from one of these NGOs um, or support groups. And if that doesn't go anywhere, they might go on TV. Um, and Going on TV has its own risks. Um, oftentimes, the producers of the shows won't allow people who don't have s enough information, um, but um, or people will, you know, um, get covered in the newspaper and have a photo and things like that. So there are many different um, ways in which people go about it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tracy Oreck. Uh, I'm a Korea Society member, and as you might guess from my name, I'm also uh, a Korean American adoptee. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for doing this scholarship. Um, in 1997, when I was in college, I had wanted to study Korean American adoption, and I found that there was nothing. So I ended up studying um, the adoption of African American children by white parents instead. So you mentioned the, the 1972 uh, position paper by the black social workers. Um, so now there was nothing and now there's something. So I'm really excited to, to read you. your work. So thank you for that. Um, my question was, I heard you say this term that I've never heard before called contingent essentialism. Um, and I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about that. Is it your term? How did it come about? Um, and what precisely do you, do you mean by that? Great. Thank you for that question. Yes, it is my own coinage. Um, so contingent essentialism, I, um, I was interested in the fact that so many adoptees um, who become involved in these kinds of um, collective um, 
organizations or this broader social movement of uh, Korean adoptees, um, you know, seem to invest in this idea of being a Korean adoptee. And um, what often talk, like, like the quotes that I mentioned, you know, this idea that there's something essential about being a Korean adoptee that's tied to common ghosts, common experiences, the sense of meeting each other and just clicking, right, because of those um, experiences. And yet when you look at adoptees uh, demographically, you know, they are, they are very diverse, right? But what it can tell us about is the ways in which the broader context uh, in which they grew up um, conditioned certain attitudes because there are these dominant categories by which people um, know individuals. So for instance, adoptees um, often talk about being in between, right, betwixt and between, because they're between being white and Asian, or white and Korean, <clears throat> or between being, um, uh, uh, you know, um, what can I think of any? Well, or between being a child or an adult, even. Um, and uh, so those kinds of um, feelings of not really fitting anywhere um, s tells us something about how broader social categories are very powerful. And so um, when I was thinking about what I had heard from adoptees, I was like, okay, so you know, they have this kind of strong bond that they feel amongst themselves. And it's strong enough that non-adoptees will feel very excluded or can feel very excluded when they're in adoptee-only spaces. Um, so the, uh, the idea of contingent essentialism is, is trying to describe what is it about adoptees that brings them all together. And a lot of people assume that adoptees who go back to Korea, adoptees who associate with other adoptees, that they're um, kind of re retrogressively nationalistic, or they're, um, you know, they're um, geneticists in the sense that they um, uh, believe that their true identities are connected only to their roots, you know, to their biological roots. And what I found is it's much more complicated than that, you know, because you have adoptees who say, I really feel like I'm Korean, but of course I love my parents. Right? I want to be able to have two mothers. I want to have an expansive sense of family and community. And I want to be transnational. I want to be able to live in different places like Korea and in, uh, and in the US or wherever. And so um, contingent essentialism is a way of talking about, well, it's not that the adoptees um, are uh, nationalistic or obsessed with genetics or, or biology. It's that. Um, what they don't have is knowledge of their origins or their bloodlines or their um, or what it means to be Korean, and it's precisely that contingency, right? The fact that, as I said in the quote, you know, he could be her, I could be you, she could be him, etc. This idea that you know, adoptees will say, "Oh, you're adopted to France. I wish I was French, right? But I was adopted to New Jersey, you know." <laughs> And, you know, but the idea that, you know, one could have gone anywhere and become any kind of person, right, that's quite unusual, right? You know, for people who aren't adopted, this sense of grounding in a, um, a family tree or, or ethnicity or a racial identity, um, without that, adoptees, I would argue, have this kind of sense of contingency, right, ungrounding, non-rooted sense of identity that they then um, situate as their common source of identification, if that makes sense to you. So, um, so that's what I mean by contingent essentialism, is taking the really unstable, ungrounded sense of a lack of origins or a lack of blood identity and making something essential out of that. And what I would also argue is that, you know, as we enter into a much more globalized, you know, multiculturalism and complex world, that many more people will also find themselves identifying through not um, this kind of traditional sense of identity that goes way back into time because we can trace our genealogies, but through a sense of presentness, right? That it's the fact that we all exist in these kinds of unstable flows of experience and relationships that makes us part of a community. So um, that's something that I think is worth thinking about. You know, why is it that we put so much significance and 
um, importance on these kinds of essentialized identities that are traditionally understood as important, right? Nation, family, or kinship, and blood. And how can we sort of expand out of that to think about communities and belonging in a different way? That came, I am um, asked by the high authority to make it short. <laughs> May I just say uh, one thing about what you said? There are kind of adoptions which are not legal, but informal, and yet so powerful, so deep. And that happened during the Korean War. American soldiers picked up orphans in the battlefield and brought them to their unit. And I wondered all the time why, why they were so nice to them. You know why? And this is only very short answer I found lately because they, are, they missed their own children back home. That's the Korean story. And I am glad I say this because when General Sharp was here, I mentioned it. And he said he was going to tell his troops American soldiers were so generous. In fact, the one convoy I was in stopped. 50 cars stopped to pick up one crying little boy. And I'm so proud. I don't know what happened to him. But that's humanity. That's love. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, of course there is some controversy in terms of a credit, mm -hmm. but uh, yes, there was uh, evidence that there was a record how uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers have been uh, passionately involved in saving an orphan during the, the Korean War. Yeah, um, definitely. And actually, the, I have a uh, chapter in my book that talks about these early informal adoptions by American military battalions of these mostly boys, Korean boys. And Battle Hymn is yeah, a very famous film that's kind of controversial. But yeah, and I think that that early history is quite fascinating because um, you know, it's mostly American male soldiers adopting these young Korean boys. And some of them actually brought them home to the US. Um, but that caused a lot of consternation for American social workers who said, uh, we're having young American single soldiers trying to adopt young Korean boys. This can't happen, right? It's 1950s America. You have to be a nuclear family, right? So in that instance, usually the parents of the GI would legally adopt the Korean boy. And they, they tended to be older. Um, and those are really fascinating, I think. Um, that's a fascinating kind of prehistory to this. And it really, uh, what I write about in my book is the, there's so much coverage of these young boys being uh, adopted by American soldiers that that really helped inform the broader American public about these children and kind of um, influenced their um, attitudes towards Korean children. The other thing I found is that, um, you know, Kore the Korean War was very misunderstood by Americans in the 1950s. No one understood why America was back in another war so shortly after World War II. You know, it was the very beginning of the Cold War. People didn't even know where Korea was on a map. So in a way, the care of these children, the humanitarian effort that went into helping these Korean children helped to rationalize and justify the uh, existence of soldiers in South Korea among the U.S. public. You know, the idea is, oh, actually, we're, you know, Korea, adult Koreans were of no interest, right? Who's, who, who's Korea? What are Koreans, you know? But children, you know, innocent children. So the, idea, so the very earliest point of the Cold War was justified through the saving of innocent Korean children. 
And this was a very actively um, developed uh, rationale by Pearl Buck, for instance, very famous uh, missionary. And the adoptions of mixed race children were also um, uh, influenced um, and encouraged by Pearl Buck in the in the early years. So, you know, that I think that kind of prehistory of adoption is really important. So, thank you for bringing it up. After, well, actually, we're we're over time. So, uh, just no. help me thank uh, okay. Dr. Elena Kim. <laughs> And I think we have uh, some books outside, and Dr. Kim said that she would uh, sign, right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.